Good morning, everyone. Good morning and uh, welcome to ORCHIDS 101. I'm Shannon Fitzpatrick. I am um, happy to be representing the Pleasant Hill management team today from, um, from SLOAT. We'd love to have you come out and visit us there out on Contra Costa Boulevard if you're ever in the East Bay. Um, I know you have lots of choices of SLOATs to, to visit, but by all means, come out and visit us at ours. Um, again, welcome to ORCHIDS 101. I am super excited to have this, this one today just because I struggle with orchids. I struggle with orchids probably more than any other plant. Um, I'm super excited that Paul is here to share all of his expertise with us today. Again, Paul Bourbon is coming from the San Francisco Orchid Society. Um, he also works as a volunteer at the Conservatory of Flowers. I always wanna mess up that name. Um, he works there as a docent and is a uh, horticulture volunteer working in the warm orchid greenhouse, which automatically sounds exciting because I already have absolutely no idea exactly what that means. So I'm really excited, as I mentioned, to be part of this presentation today. Um, I actually had an opportunity to visit the conservatory pre-COVID just on a whim, and it is absolutely gorgeous. If you haven't been there lately, you absolutely need to put it on your bucket list. It is phenomenal, and you'll be so blown away at all the options and all the cool stuff that they have there, and they are just a wealth of information. So by all means, go visit them. Okay, on to uh, what I'm supposed to be talking about. Uh, you guys should have all received an outline in your email that will kind of help you follow along with the presentation today. Um, I am going to try to answer some questions here and there during the presentation, but for the most part, um, I'd like to kind of save some so that Paul can answer them when the time comes. So we'll do some kind of in the middle around where, um, where he has a breaking point in his outline and then we'll do some more at the end. So I'll do my best to answer some that are more basic, but where I see repetitive questions that make more sense for Paul, I'll definitely have him answer those and save them. So if I haven't answered you, please don't feel like I'm ignoring you. Um, also reminding you that this is being recorded and you will have an opportunity to watch it again. So if by chance you missed something or you want him to repeat something, know that it will be on the um, on Slot's website. I think it's up by Tuesday if I'm correct. It's usually up by the following Tuesday. She says 10-5. I'm assuming that that's Tuesday, forgive me. Um, so you can always look at it there, go back, anything that you missed, you can catch up on it then. Um, our upcoming classes, we do have um, a list upcoming during the month of October. We're doing Beyond Lawns on the 9th with Bonnie Morse. We're doing Soil Health Basics with Charlotte Canner and Susan Batempo from Oh Wow, which is really cool on uh, 1016. That's from Our Water, Our World, a really cool organization, wealth of information again. And then our own Jen Strobel will be creating a succulent pumpkin. You do not want to miss this. This is the class to uh, be a part of, and that's going to be on the 20th. Hope you guys have all made it down into your local slope to get a few pumpkins. We've got carvers in stock now. We have some really beautiful kind of premium fancy pumpkins and, um, and the gourds and stuff, they're gorgeous. So feel free to get on down and get one if you haven't. Um, all questions I'm gonna take through Q&A and um, I think that's it. I think I've covered everything I'm supposed to cover. Again, really excited to welcome Paul this morning and I'm gonna pass it on to him. Yeah, good morning. I've been asked to do this because over the years, I worked, oh, about 35 years growing orchids for myself. And for about 14 years before I retired, I grew them professionally. So during the um, orchid shows, I was always asked to be the orchid doctor. And people would bring their plants or tell me about their plants, and I try to help make them grow better. After that, I found out that people had a hard time repotting them. So I also did repotting demonstrations and from that have more of these little talks about orchids. Now, first thing I would like to talk about is what is an orchid? We go to an orchid show and we see all kinds of different flowers. They look very different, but yet they're all in the same family. And the reason it's so is because an orchid is a relatively simple thing. It's a monocot. It means it has one seed leaf 
when it first uh, starts to germinate. And then because of that, everything happens in threes. And an orchid always has three petals and three sepals. Now the sepals are actually part of the bud. And if you see the bud, you'll see it starts to crack. It'll crack into three distinct pieces. They, they become pigmented and you have the sepals here. This is one sepal, another sepal, the third sepal is over here. Then inside the bud, we have three petals. This is one petal, the other one. And the third one is always modified to form a lip. And inside that lip, there is a column. Orchids have their um, reproductive organs on one, on one structure rather than separately as most other plants do. And the pollen is in little tiny packets. And these packets are very sticky. And so that's one nice thing about growing orchids. You don't get hay fever from them. And that's all it takes to be an orchid. So within that very broad palette, orchids have evolved into many, many, many different uh, forms. Now, one of the things I like to talk about is some of the myths surrounding orchids. A lot of people think that orchids are rare. They're not rare at all. There are 28,000 species of orchids on this planet and about 100,000 hybrids that are registered. And in that group, they are all over the world. They grow on every continent except Antarctica. They grow everywhere between the Arctic Circle and the Antarctic Circle. There are no marine or aquatic orchids, although some of my clients seem to think there were, but they grow just about everywhere except on glaciers and some of the really wicked deserts. There are native orchids here in uh, the Bay Area. They grow natively in San Francisco. The number of them grow uh, are native to um, Marin County. And so they're not rare in that respect at all. And the reason people thought they were rare is because in the old days it was very difficult to propagate them, but now we've come up with uh, ways to grow them much more easily. And another one of the myths that I call a supreme pet peeve of mine is that of watering orchids with ice cubes. The orchids that we grow tend to come from the tropics or the subtropical areas of the world. And the reason for that is, is because the um, biomass in a rainforest or in a very uh, wet area tends to be much uh, more intense than it is in the temperate zones. And so a uh, orchid has to have a bright, colorful flower in order to attract its pollinator. Although we love these flowers and we think they're very beautiful, the real reason that they have come into existence is reproduction. And so the orchid has to find, it's, have to put itself out so that the pollinator can find it in this huge mass of, of uh, plants and flowers and things. And those orchids tend to be more attractive than the ones that grow in the temperate zones, which tend to be kind of boring. So most of the ones we get are from the tropics. Now, any of us who have been to uh, a tropical or subtropical place, knows every day that it rains. And when it rains, the water is warm. So it's not good to use ice cubes. It shocks the plant. With every living being, whether it's people, plants, animals, fungus, bacteria, whatever, the closer you can replicate how they live naturally, the better chance of success you're gonna have. And so the use of ice cubes to uh, water your plant, is, is, it's, it's not right because they're used to warm water. Some people um, who get really into orchids actually have little water heaters and, keep, and use tepid water to water their plants. You don't really have to do that, but you have to uh, just leave the water at room temperature. Now, the orchids that, as you know, are pretty small plants. They don't get very large. And so what they have evolved to do is they've evolved to live in trees. In the rainforest, you have a huge canopy and it blocks out much of the light. And you have a, you know, a huge amount of plants. Orchids are small plants. If they were on the ground, they would never be able to get in the flight to live. So they evolved to live in trees. And this is the difference that we have with orchids over most of the other plants we like to grow is they're not used to living in soil. They're used to living on a tree. And, that's, and I'm going to show you how that helps us to grow our plants correctly. I, don't just tell people how to do things, but I try to tell people why. And the reason I say that way you can make, make decisions when you're looking at your plants and studying them. What am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? You might have an idea of how to make them better. Now, 
the, the way the orchids that are living in on top of a tree are not sitting in water. And not one of the number one ways that I've seen people kill orchids is they overwater them. They, put, they have them in, with sauces underneath, they're soaking up water and their roots rot. What happens in the rainforest is the water pours down very quickly for a few minutes. Then the sun comes out, everything dries out and the humidity comes up. And that's what we're looking for in, in growing orchids. Now, when you water your orchid, it's best to water it in the morning or the latest in the early afternoon. And the reason for that is orchids are attached to a tree by, by very thick roots. And these roots absorb the water as it's cascading down, but then the water leaves. And so when you have an orchid like this, we grow them in pots, but in nature, the thing is growing on the side of a tree. It's an epiphyte. It doesn't get any food from the tree, but it uses it for support. And if you notice on these orchids, there is a, a groove down the center of the leaf. It's a, um, sort of like a rain gutter. And as the plant is growing sideways, the water is going to flow away from the center of the plant. But when we rotate the plant 90 degrees to have it in our pot, it works the wrong way. It draws water into the center. What happens is the water will collect in the center of the of the, leaf, of the plant, and slowly but surely, fungus will start to grow. It gets dark in the, in the evening, it gets cooler, and then the plant starts to rot. And someday you'll just pick up the work and the leaves will just fall off. And the reason for that is, is that the fungus has, got, has had a chance to grow. When you water your orchid, what you do, don't water it like this. What you wanna do is you wanna water the pot, not the plant. The reason you're doing that again is to keep water out of the center of the plant so it doesn't uh, get fungus and rot on you. And it makes it a lot easier that way to protect the plant from, from getting sick. The other thing you wanna do is, is you want to water the plant after it starts to get dry. Don't water it every day. What you wanna do is put your finger or you can use a pencil, put it into the plant and feel it. When it's just about dry, that's the time to rewater. Remember, these roots are exposed to the air. Orchids, even though they live in very damp places, are basically dry weather plants. They want to have circulation around their roots they, and they want the roots to dry out. So therefore, try to water in the morning and water the pot, not the plant. The next thing we go into is food. Food is very important for orchids, just as it is for every other creature. But the thing is, the mixes that we use, to, that we pot our orchids in, has no food value. The only food that the orchid gets is what you give it. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to water with the plant with fertilizer water. Now, dietitians tell us it's best for us to eat a little often rather than a lot once in a while. And I found that's very true also with uh, orchids. The best thing to do is to fertilize the plant every time you water. You can um, use half strength fertilizer if you prefer, but it's give it food all on a regular basis, except about once a month. Once a month or so, flush the plant out with plain tap water. And the reason for that is that the uh, fertilizers are salts and as the water evaporates, the salts can collect in the pot and the orchids don't like that. So, Try to um, fertilize your plants regularly. Now, you can try very fancy fertilizers if you want, but most of the time, all you have to do is give your orchid what we call a balanced fertilizer. And if a balanced fertilizer, if you ever look at a, a bag of fertilizer or a package, you'll see that there are three little numbers, usually below the name of the fertilizer. You want those numbers to be about the same. They don't have to be exact, but close. Plants are not like people. They just take up what they need. They don't eat what's not good for them. So that will give you about 99% of what you need. Another thing that, that I recommend is once a month or so, just put a pinch of Epsom salts in the fertilizer water because the uh, plants do like the magnesium. And it's also part of the photosynthetic molecule. So it helps the plant to grow. That's about all you need. You can 
you know, there are red ones and green ones and yellow ones and all these other things. You don't really need that. We have them here. And um, this one is higher in nitrogen. And so it helps it to grow. And this one it tends to, uh, is more to encourage blooming. The one in the middle is sort of a balanced one. It's meant mostly for Phalaenopsis and the like. It doesn't really matter. Most commercial growers just use plain fertilizers and they do quite successfully with them. These are more convenient and uh, easier to get, but you can, whatever you use for your other plants will probably work for these as well. And the other thing that orchids require, like any photosynthetic plant is light. Now we remember this orchid is growing way up in a tree, but over that tree, there's leaves and branches and other stuff. And so orchids do not like to sit in very, very bright, intense light. They want bright light, but they want it indirectly. Remember, they're always sort of shaded in, um, by, the, by the stuff above them. So don't put them in a hot window. If, you're, you know, if, if you've ever sat in the window on a real sunny day, it feels real hot. You don't want to do that. The reason being is that you're going to cook the plant. The plant is, is, has evolved to live in indirect light. And the plant will tell you if it's getting enough light. Plants are actually do talk to us a lot and people th think I'm really crazy because I, I talk about plants talking, but you have a dog or a cat, you don't speak dog or cat, and they don't speak English, but you get your point across. Now, this is a very typical orchid leaf. And most of the time, what you want is you want your leaf to be green with just a slight tinge of yellow in it. I don't know how well the camera picks this up, but you want a slight tinge of yellow. If the plant gets too yellow, and I'll have an example right here. This is getting a little bit, this is about as far into yellow as you want to go. It's, if it starts getting too yellow, it means it's getting too much light. If it's very, very dark, a dark lush green, like a, sort of like a rubber plant, that means the plant is not getting enough light. So just move the plant closer or farther away from the light and till, the, till you get that nice green with just a little bit of yellow in it. The, um, some people use grow lights. These plants will grow very well with grow lights. If you, want to, if you want to set them up that way. They will also um, grow in a combination of both. Some people uh, have almost enough light and they just put a small, light, a small grow light above them to fortify the light. And the next thing that's very important is humidity. Orchids live in places where it's usually very humid. And the, uh, most of our houses tend to be on the dry side, the heating and the air conditioning kind of dry the house out. So your plants may not get enough humidity where, um, wherever you put them in your home. This is one, one way to help that. This we call this a humidity tray. And basically, all it is, is a plastic or, or you can use a porcelain. I, I don't like metal myself, but anything else will work, full of gravel. Now, this should probably be filled up a little higher. And then what you do is you pour water onto the gravel, almost to the top of the, of the gravel, but not quite. And then you place the plant on top of it. The water will evaporate, and that will give you the humidity you need, humidity you need to make your plants grow better. The, um, there are a lot of other things that orchids like. One thing is they like air movement. You know, you always talk about tropical breezes. There's, where they live, there's always a breeze. There's always wind. We're not talking about the Santa Ana's here, but we're talking about just a nice, gentle breeze. They like air movement. Also, air movement helps prevent them from getting fungus. So if you can grow, have a little open window or perhaps a small fan running near your plants, they will appreciate that. They like a little bit of air when they're um, growing. Other things that you want to do is you, you have choices in pots. Now, the, or, the pots that are used for orchids, um, any regular pot, uh, pot that's used for almost everything else will work, but some pots are better than others. Most people grow their orchids in plastic pots. You can use terracotta pots, and some people like them because they're heavier, and orchids tend to be top heavy, so they don't fall over as easily. But the other thing is, is that the plastic pot allows the roots to slip down along it. Remember, the roots in orchids, and I'll show you more about that when we do the, uh, the repotting, are wiggling down and trying to anchor the plant in the bark of the tree. And so 
you don't uh, you don't need to uh, you know what um, what was it? I've lost my train. You you don't need to. Um, I forgot what I was saying. Pardon? You, you don't have to worry about, you know, pushing the plant into the... Yeah. yeah, you don't have to worry about um, digging the plant out. I'm sorry. I don't use terracotta pots, so I forget. But what happens is the orchid roots will actually embed themselves in the terracotta. And then when you try to repot the plant, you're trying to take it out, you tear off all the roots and a lot of them are stuck in the pot. So that's why I use plastic. Now, there are a lot of different kinds of pots. Um, this one here is a very nice pot. We call these slot pots. Notice the, the, the plant has, the pot, excuse me, has a bunch of slots. This allows for more air circulation. Everything about orchid roots has to do with air circulation. And these will provide more circulation than just a regular solid pot like this one. Some people grow them in net pots. Now, net pod, you can see, allows for a lot of air circulation. Also, you, they're easy to hang because eventually you're going to run out of room and you're going to start to hang your plants. But um, these are very nice for growing orchids because they permit air circulation. One of the current popular pots for growing orchids is this. It has the slots here. And notice that, it's, that the uh, bottom is raised up and there's sort of grooves so the water can drain away because you don't want the plant to sit in water. A lot of pots have a built-in saucer don't, don't, um, don't ever put a plant, an orchid in a, a plant with a saucer. Also, it's clear or almost clear, sort of opaque. And the roots of orchids do have green tips. And so they are photosynthetic. And a lot of people think that extra bit of light helps the plant to grow better. So that covers the basics of growing just about any kind of orchid. But there is a disclaimer here. And with Orchids growing all over the world in many, many different places. What I'm saying is, is very, is, is, are generalities. And the generalities are, are to help you grow the plants you're most likely to encounter in uh, flower shops or, or uh, nurseries or something like that. But there are many, many orchids that are exceptions to much of what I say. Some require dormancy, sometimes in winter, sometimes in summer. And they, and they require other special types of care. Some can only grow a mountain on a piece of wood and various other things. So the best thing I recommend for you to do is to also study the, the plant that you're growing and learn all you can about it. And that way you will provide the happiest environment for it and move very, very well. Now, um, I believe we're, we, we should take a break about now and then we'll discuss repotting. Any questions? Yeah. Any questions? Yes, I have got some questions here for you, Paul, a couple of them. You mentioned early on um, that if there's fungus in the plant from watering, like if you're watering into the center of it and you get that, um, that fungus in there and the leaves fall off, is there any way to come back from that or once it's there, it's there? Generally speaking, the plant is dead. Okay. Uh, now with with the uh, some symphobial type plant orchids like this, sometimes a leaf will rot off, but the pseudo bulb here will remain. And okay. sometimes if you're very if you're very careful and you that you can, and you put it in a in a new pot, small pot, and let it um, stay almost dry, water it very sparingly, the roots will begin to reappear. And when the roots reappear, then you can bring the plant back. But for the most part. Once the fungus is taken over, especially with these kind, because the whole the, the, the growth part of the plant, when the plant grows from the center here, once that's uh, killed, the plant cannot be, be brought back to life. And I've seen it happen. Okay. <laughs> I've done it myself. Any other questions? Yeah, so we've got a few more. One is, um, and I, you're going to go into repotting in a minute. Are you going to touch on like splitting plants when you talk about repotting? I will. Okay, perfect. And then we're, we're assuming that the rules that you're talking about with orchids in general relate to all orchids, like cymbidiums also? Yes, uh, cymbidiums, yes. There are many orchids not, but cymbidiums are a very common orchid that we grow outside here in the Bay Area. And the rules follow pretty much. In fact, one thing you can do when you're repotting with cymbidiums, you have a bunch of what we call back bulbs, and bulbs are no longer have leaves on them. 
if you take those bulbs and put them in a small pot, even though they have they have roots, but they have no leaves, they will sprout a whole new plant. And so right. you can a whole lot of plants from one plant to another pot. It. Okay. And then um, you mentioned that when using those, the clear kind of orchid pots, the plastic ones, that um, the roots tend to get kind of bound up in there and they, they like it more to be, you know, kind of a tight squeeze in there. Oh yes, we call it the tight shoes. Orchids, remember, are living on a tree and their whole basis for existence is getting those roots to lock the plant high up in that tree because if the plant falls out of the tree, it's going to land on the ground where there's no light and the plant's going to die. The first priority of any orchid, or at least of epiphytic ones, is to firmly anchor the plant on the tree. And that's part of what we, I, I show in the, in the pot. Sure. Part of the pot so that you're simulating that and so the plant is happy. Okay. And then um, what about, I don't think that you've talked much about. Um, like insects or any kind of, you know, how to combat spider mites, how to combat other, you know, um, infiltrators from outside. And like you said, it's kind of hard to match the exact environment that, that orchids grow in naturally. So while we're humidifying and while we're trying to find a warm spot, how do we keep them from, you know, being infested with insects? I will go into that. Generally, I go into that after the potting part. So okay. I talk extensively about taking care about to take care of pests because they, they do show up and they can run yeah. I will get into that. Soon. Okay. Perfect. Then one last question and I will let you get back to your uh, to your outline. Um, we had a couple people that are interested in trying to grow orchids on a more natural basis. So you mentioned that they tend to grow better outside, you know, that that's where they're found na naturally, um, obviously in the rainforest, which is so difficult for us to <laughs> duplicate here, even when we try our hardest in a shady area in the garden. Is it possible to, to grow them like on a tree if you were able to kind of get them wrapped around and get them set with, you know, maybe some kind of landscapers, you know, tape or something like that. Is it possible to grow them outside or is it, uh, you know, kind of a fool's errand? Yeah, um, it's not a problem at all. Um, I, uh, like some videos and everything, there are a number of orchids that grow very well out of doors in the Bay Area. And uh, because orchids grow at different elevations, Different, uh, they require different amount, different amounts of heat, and there are many roots grow high enough in the tropics to live very comfortably here. And you can grow them on your trees, or you can mount them. A lot of people mount their orchids, and what they do is they get a, a piece of uh, a piece of wood. Some people use shingles, some people use cork, whatever, and you attach the plant. You, you've put a big, you put sphagnum moss, and I'll show sphagnum moss later around the roots of the plant. And then you attach the plant to the piece of wood by wrapping it with uh, like fishing line. And you tie it down and then you can hang that plant either in your greenhouse or outside, or you can attach it to your tree. The one thing about mounting orchids though, you have to water them every day. Mm. They, the pot holds in a lot of moisture, but when they're exposed to the air, as they are in nature, right. they get in the pond just about every day. Right. And so it fits. And so yes, you can. And I will talk about a number of orchids that we can grow out of doors. Um, Cymbidiums are probably the most common orchids to grow out of doors. They're right. very, very uh, tough. They don't, uh, they, they, they don't suffer very well. They can take it down to, oh, about 28 degrees or even cooler for a while. Uh, another great one to grow is uh, Dendrobium kingiana. And they produce, so we have one here to show, I think. They produce a lot of very nice flowers. It's not that, it's not this, one, <laughs> this one needs help, but um, they produce, it's a small plant that produces a lot of flowers. They're small, they can go from white to pink, red, and they grow very well right next to your some They can grow out of doors. They're easy and small enough that you can mount them. However, there is one caveat where this plant grows, it needs a dry rest. And so from mm -hmm. Halloween until about November, uh, say Thanksgiving uh, or the end of November, something. You have to let the plant be completely dry because where it lives, it is completely dry. And so you want to simulate where it lives naturally. And the problem is, 
in the Bay Area, if it rains, that's what it usually does. Right. So you're going to have to bring the plants in or keep it out of the, in this sheltered area where it doesn't get rained upon for those two months. In, uh, in Cyclia citrina, or Chile citrina, it's the same thing. Grows very well outdoors in the Bay Area. There are yeah. dozens, dozens of them in the And okay. what was the name of that, that one again? I'm sorry. What was the name of that plant again? I apologize. Uh, Dendrobium keniana. Okay, we're going to have to get the spelling of that <laughs> at some point, <laughs> and I'll make sure and post it. <laughs> I have the tag here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I promise everybody, I will. Uh, you see that? There we go. Oh, oh, Dendrobium congenitum. Okay, mm -hmm. everybody, there it is. That's a very good one yeah, yeah. to start with. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Paul. I'm going to let you get on to the uh, finishing out the um, the potting section of the um, of the webinar. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Ready? Okay. Um, this is an example of an orchid that uh, somebody may give you or you may buy at the store. And it actually came with another little plant. Florists like to make these uh, ensembles and they can be very pretty. This one had a um, house plants as well as the regular plant and uh, the orchid here. So I took that out just because it's not relevant to what we're doing. So first thing we have to do is we have to get all of this stuff that they put, they, they put this decorative moss. This is not good moss for growing plants. I mean, it's, it's okay as a decorative adjunct, but it's not a, a good growth medium. And they put it in here into this this decorative pot. Now, one thing you have to be very careful about decorative pots, I'll just, and they just use a bunch of bark in here to uh, hold everything together. This pot has no hole in the bottom. And many, many orchids that you will, will get will come in a pretty pot with no hole in the bottom. That's, I have to change this. I always used to say, so you don't leak um, water on your TV set, but you can't put these on your TV set. To leak, you, know, you don't want the water leaking on your coffee table, so you put it in something like this. What happens is you water the plant, you water the plant, it fills up with water and you drown it. It's okay to use these kind of pots, just have a regular orchid pot, have the orchid growing in a regular pot, and then you can take the plant over to water it. Now they put it in this, it, it, this plant is, has spent its life in this little flimsy plastic pot. And if you get a plant that's in one of these, it's, it's pretty, important to repot it as soon as you, as soon as it finishes flowering. Now, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cut, I'm going to cut the flower off because normally you don't repot until the flowers have died and the plant has started to grow again. When the plant is actively growing, so it's time to repot, but we're doing this for demonstration purposes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sterilize I'm going to sterilize my, my uh, cutting tools. You have to sterilize them because orchids can get viruses. And the viruses are transmitted very easily if you cut into one plant and then cut into another plant. So you can use the, you can sterilize your instrument, do all the work with that plant. But as soon as you're ready to go to the next plant, re-sterilize it again. Now I use the torch here. These torches are very nice. And if you're gonna do a lot of plants, they're very convenient. But if you just have a few plants and you don't want to invest in a torch, you can use one of those uh, lighters that to use for lighting charcoal or fireplaces and things like that. Or you can use a Zippo lighter. If you have a gas stove, the gas flame will work. It should be a flame though. So now that I've sterilized my instrument, I'm going to cut the flower off. Normally I wouldn't do that. I would wait until the flower died. And where I'm going to cut it off is right down where, right, let's get this out of the way is right about where the stem reaches, reaches the plant, it touches the plant. I'm just gonna cut this off. Oh, no. Some people, and another myth that I do not like, is they say, well, if you cut, if, if you, after this is um, finished flowering, cut it off just above one of these nodes here, this little tiny spots, and it'll send out another shoot. 
Well, one, it looks kind of funky because it's small. You won't get as many flowers. And what you're doing is you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. The problem is orchids, because they have such beautiful intense flowers, cannot produce with, through photosynthesis enough energy to flower. So what they do is they store it up and they store up food and then they use it in one big burst of flower, kind of like uh, carbo loading. Some of them have pseudo bulbs, which this plant has, and this is for food storage. So the cymbidiums and so forth. Others store it in tubers or in thick stems or in big leaves. And the reason they do that is to have extra food. If you force it to flower a second time on that stem, you're taking next year's energy for this year's flowers. So next year, your flowers won't be as nice. So that's why I recommend against doing it. Now, what we've got here is we have our plant and we can see the roots. The roots are very, very thick. Here's, there's the root. And this, this is very, very important. These are good roots. They're nice and white, gray, green tips. And what I'm doing is I'm removing all of the old mix. And you have to remove all the old mix because the mix breaks down. You know, it's plant material it's, and it, it rots. And when it rots, it produces things that aren't good for the plant. So you have hey, to Paul, repot you your orchid. The white, the white this is all sphagnum moss. All the time. These plants come from Taiwan and they use sphagnum moss extensively there. Sphagnum moss is one, is a very good medium and I will show you how to repot with it. In fact, I might just repot this one with it. Now, we call this the root and I'm gonna do something, you can see the green tip and I'm gonna see if I can do this properly. Uh, I don't know how well this is gonna show up. I'm trying to make it a little bigger. But what we call the, what you see as the root is not really, it's this little tiny uh, thread licking thing here, that's the true root yeah. of the orchid. And it's very strong. As you can see, I can hold the plant by, by its root. The sheath that covers that root, not only does it worm its way in and anchor the plant into the bark, it also acts like a sponge. It rains very quickly. The water is running down the tree and the, the sheath soaks up the water. And when it does that, it then can time release the water into the root as the plant needs it. So you can see these plants are designed not to stay in water. Now I keep removing all of this stuff. Now I'll, you can use a jet of, um, of water. We're not talking about the power wash you used to um, take the paint off the side of your house, but we just want to give it a nice gentle jet. You can flush off a lot of the stuff. I don't think they want me to do this here and run water off of the floor. And I'm getting rid of the other flower spike here. Same thing, just cutting it off. Now, if you look at the roots, these roots are all pretty healthy. And sometimes you'll see a root that's old and it's, it's dead, it's black, it looks squishy. Cut it off and you don't need that anymore. This is, this is kind of an old root here. You see it's kind of shriveled and it's on its way out. So we're just gonna cut that off. What we end up with is a plant in its, all its glory here. Now, a lot of times you'll find that your orchid will grow the roots outside of the pot. And some people call those air roots and that's fine. But when we repot it, we're gonna put all the roots back into the, into the pot. And that way they can absorb the food and the water that they need to make the plant grow. Now, if you're gonna get into growing orchids, you're gonna to have to have a lot of uh, different sized pots because you're never quite sure what kind of roots you're going to have and how big the, uh, the, the growth and the root growth is. So, what you want to do is you want to put this plant in the smallest pot that you can comfortably cram the roots into. A lot of people say, well, if I put it in a big pot, then I won't have to repot it this often. No, the mix breaks down. And when the mix breaks down, it starts to pack down and the roots suffocate and die. So what you want to do is you want to put it in the, in a, in a pot which, it will, which the roots are fairly snugly into. Also, if you use a large pot, the water is not absorbed by the plant and it sits there. 
And again, you have root rot. Plants grow from their roots. Now, let's see here. This is a nice looking pot. We try it out first. Yeah, sometimes you kind of have to screw the, or twist the roots into the pot. But if you look inside, you can see that, the, that most of the pot is taken up with root. And that's gonna be the perfect pot for this plant. Now, there are a lot of mixes and you talk to any orchid grower, he's gonna have his secret mix and it's gonna be different from everybody else's. Well, I'm gonna bring up here though, are the basic mixes that'll get you through just about everything. Now, the primary component of most mixes nowadays is bark. We call this orchid bark. You can buy it at any, um, any good place. It comes in different um, sizes. This is what they call medium. And the medium bark is about the largest you'd wanna use with most orchids. This is a smaller, finer bark, they call it fine. And I've mixed in some perlite. This white stuff is perlite. And perlite is used a lot, especially in, when you have a, a fine mix because it doesn't break down. So it helps keep the, the, the mix open. Also, it doesn't hold water well, so it keeps it from getting soggy. So I've mixed in a little bit of perlite here, maybe 10, 15%, 20% perlite. And what you want is, you want, if you can get it, is to get this large perlite that's about the size of a pea. It's better than, than finer perlite simply because it helps keep the mix more open. Now, what size to use? Well, it's pretty easy. Large roots, large bark, small roots, small, small bark. And this particular plant is what well, would be considered a large root. See how thick that root is? It's maybe 3 sixteenths of an inch thick. So it's, it's a pretty thick root. So I'm gonna use the large bark. Is that true for all phalaenopsis? Would David need the large bark? Or? Almost all phalaenopsis. There are a few uh, natural, uh, we call them species that have th uh, smaller roots. But for most Phalaenopsis, this is the proper size to use. And you first, okay, first I'll put a little bit on the bottom, just a tiny bit on the bottom, just to sort of cover it. Then I'll work the roots in. And you kind of want to put it in the center. And then I'll just pour in lots of bark. Pack it in. Now, remember, we're trying to simulate how this plant lives in nature and it lives rather packed rather stoutly onto its tree. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pack the bark in rather tightly. And the reason I do that is so that it will hold the plant very, very firm. If a plant is, well, it's not in very well. So you see how it wiggles? If it moves around like that, it's gonna grow roots because its first priority is to get anchored into the tree. And so it'll keep growing roots until it feels like it's anchored. Well, of course it's gonna keep flopping around. So it's gonna, it's gonna put all its energy in the roots. It grows all the roots, it can't grow leaves. It doesn't grow leaves, it's not gonna flower. So we want these to flower. So we're gonna pack them in tight. And, and I just keep working more bark in. It's not difficult. Hey Paul, those gray roots that that come up are we'll they are they dead roots? I like to leave a little bit of I like to have the bark a little bit below the top of the pot because that way the, the when the, when you water it the water won't flow over the top and flush the bark out. Oh, another thing about watering I forgot. Don't water by immersion. A lot of people think they can get a you know big tub or a bucket and dunk the plant in it for a while, take it out, let it drain, put the next pot in, plant in. Don't do that. Because if there is a, a, a pest or something on that first plant, every subsequent plant is going to be infected with it. So you don't want to spread pathogens. So never water by immersion. Okay, I'm gonna press this down. If you have trouble pressing it down, you can use a, a lot of people use what they call a potting stick, but the, the end of a hammer handle or something like that will work. And you can just pack it down snugly. You're not gonna hurt the roots. The roots are tough. Okay. There, now, I, I, I gotta pack it down more tightly. Use about 
five times more bark than you think you're going to. Keep going around. Just keep pushing it in. And there we go. Not quite. First. Yeah, I do. It has to be in there tightly. Now, you can see that it's, there's a little bit of space around the top. The plant's pretty much centered. Most of the roots are in this one. There we go. And when I, it won't, it doesn't move. Of course, the ends of the leaves will move, but the plant is not wiggling loose in the pot. Very important. Now, this is what we call a monopodal orchid. It means one foot. These plants grow, have a, grow like vines. They basically have one growth point and they will continue to make leaves and they will slowly grow up. They grow vertically up the side of the tree that they're living on. And so the way that you want to put these in is you want to put them in the center and you want the plant to have space to grow. Now, eventually the older leaves will fall off. That's okay. If the eldest leaf falls off it's, and it's growing a new one, everything is fine. But if it starts losing other leaves or they start turning yellow or something, then you have a problem. But if the oldest leaf dies after a few years, that's okay. They only live a couple of years anyway. Now, this kind of orchid, we call a, a sympodial orchid. And you can see it grows in a very different way. This one has a more of a horizontal growth pattern. It'll produce a pseudobulb and then it produces, which we can't see a small rhizome. And then it'll produce another pseudobulb and then it'll produce another growth. And it keeps going down the line. So they grow more, more um, uh, horizontally. Now, let's see what we have here. This orchid I, I brought for many reasons. One of them is to show you this. You see this leaf, how it has sort of an accordion pleat to it. That means that this plant is not getting enough water. Now, there are two ways a plant cannot get enough water. One is you don't give it enough. But 90% of the time, it's this. The roots are, many of them have rotted off and died. And the plant has no roots to absorb water into it. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove as much of the dead roots as we possibly can. Again, I sterilize my instrument here. I see how these are much finer roots. The yes, these have much smaller roots. These are the good roots here. <clears throat> and you can see that they are very fine. And you can see here how it grows. The way it grows is this was the original bulb here. And this bulb is bigger. And that's what you want to. You know you're doing well if the next leaf or the next bulb is a little bigger than one before it. And then things started to happen. And this plant, you see this bulb is a little bit smaller. Now you can see the growth coming out of the um, pseudo bulb here. These are new growths. And these new growths don't have their bulbs yet. And that's about the time you want to repot one of these is when it's got these nice new little growths. Here you can see the rhizome really well there. Now, if you want to divide this plant, you can. And what you want to do is these plants have more than what we call leads. They will have one growth point and then they will divide sort of in the Y shape. Then they have two leads and then they'll, they'll make more. This one has, if I wanted to divide it, I would divide it here and here. See, this would give me a good bulb and then a new, a new uh, growth here. And this would give me this, this bulb with the growths here. So that way, I, all you have to do is just cut it, if you want to, right here. Is that a, what type of orchid? Is that oncidium? This is an oncidium. And um, they're very common. They're interesting uh, flowers. They only have four colors, but they, they make millions of different variations on that. And they're also, remember this, now see these roots are gone. These roots are very rotten. I should put a new glove on. So I'm gonna cut those off because all they're gonna do is add trouble to the plant. Now, because the roots are poor on this one, I'm not going to divide it. 
I will keep it as one plant because this part has got the good roots on it. This part will supply food for it. So I'm not going to remove most of it. I'll, I'll remove one of them, but it, um, it'll get the plant going again. Had this had good roots, I probably would divide it, make two plants if I need two plants. Now I'm just going to remove this whole pseudo bulb here. Cut it off. And that can go into the compost. Now, these plants grow horizontally. So you want to pot them a little differently than you would others. Let me see if I can find a good size pot here. Uh, here we go. Okay. Uh, we'll use this one, I think. This one. Well, and we have very little roots, so we're kind of stuck. I won't use a bigger pot, but the way these grow is they grow, they grow horizontally. So what you want to do when you repot this is don't put it, put it in the center, because then it's going to grow out of the pot very quickly. Put it so that the old part is up against one side of the pot or a corner if it's a square pot, and that way the plant will continue to grow in this direction and they'll stay in the pot longer. Um, this is actually too large a pot, but I'm going to see if I, this one. that's a little too small. Well, yeah, I, mean, I hate to, yeah, it'll, it'll. <laughs> now the rule of thumb when you're working with, um, orchids that have these pseudobulbs is you want to allow about two pseudobulb thicknesses between where the end of the plant is now and where the end of the pot is. So that'll take a two years for it to grow to the end. You want to repot these about every two or three years. All orchids should be repotted every two or three years, some more often, but anyway. The thing is, that way, when the plant starts to grow out of the pot, and if you have ones growing out of the pot, it needs to be repotted, it'll tell you when to repot it. So normally I would use a bigger pot with a plant this size, but because the roots are so poor, I'm stuck. Now I'm gonna use, I could be using this fine bark, but I wanna show you how to use sphagnum moss. So we're gonna use it instead. And I'm going to change my glove because I have a hole in it. Now, I'm, you see I'm wearing gloves now. You don't necessarily have to wear gloves when you're doing a lot with orchids, but if you're working with sphagnum moss, it's very important that you do so. And the reason being is that sphagnum moss grows in what they call sphagnum hummocks. They grow in bogs and swamps and places like that. And then this stuff is harvested and dried and then packaged and sent to you. Well, there are a lot of things that grow in bogs. And one of the things that grows in bogs are little moles and fungi and things that have spores. And spores can live a very, very long time. Now, sphagnum moss, this is a very nice potting uh, medium. Sphagnum moss. As you see, it's a moss. It has no real structure, but it has little tiny hooks or barbs, and they're microscopic, and that's what holds the pieces of the plant together in the bog. Well, sometimes spores can embed themselves right where those little hooks are, and you could be working with this with bare hands, and you'll get the tiniest of cuts. You won't feel it. You won't notice it. You won't bleed. But it'll it'll you know heal over quickly. Spores can get in there. Now the spores are in a nice, warm, moist place. So what do they do? They grow and they attack your skin, and it can turn your skin into something like jello. So you don't want to get that. It's very rare. I've known people who've worked with sphagnum moss for years and never use gloves, and they come out of it fine. But you don't want to be that one person. These gloves are all you need. You don't need to use leather gauntlets or anything. Just these plain medical gloves that we all have now because of COVID work perfectly. And that's all you need to protect yourself. That's very important that you do. Always work with sphagnum moss wet. Now I've already pre-wetted this. And when you, um, when you get the moss, it'll be very tightly packed in a bundle as, you, as she can show you here while I'm getting my dish out. Okay, it'll be very tight. So what you wanna do after you get it soaked is you wanna take it apart. It'll be, it'll just sort of un, unshredded, un, um, 
pack it. Just take it apart. Makes it, it makes it looser. It makes it go further and stuff is not cheap. And when you're using moss, sphagnum moss, always make sure it's New Zealand sphagnum moss. That's very, very important. Um, the, um, sphagnum moss grows in a lot of places, but in this, the stuff in New Zealand, it's, it lasts longer and it holds up better. And it's more free of, of uh, weeds and miscellaneous stuff. Uh, a lot of sphagnum moss and expensive stuff comes from Chile and other places. And there they have all kinds of stuff growing. You've got a whole botanic garden in every bale and you don't want that. So look on the, on the, on the package. It will say New Zealand sphagnum moss. If, it is, like, um, if it's 100% blue agave tequila, it's gonna say it on the label if it is. So same thing here, shred the stuff, get it all apart. I've sort of pre-shredded this a little bit before I started. Now, the way you use sphagnum moss, it's kind of fun. It's easier to pot with it, but it's harder to repot with it. Now, what you do is you put a little bit of the moss in the bottom of this pot. Maybe a half an inch to an inch. You can see that in there. Okay. Then I take the plant. This is the old end. I'm pushing it up against the side of the pot. And then I'm going, to, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this end and I'm going to fill it full of moss. I'm going to make a big ball of moss like this. So I, if, if you're planting in the center of the pot, you cover both sides. If you're going to plant towards one side, you of course put more moss on, on that side. And I get a big wad like this. And all I do is I stuff it right into the pot. And we do it neatly. Pack it down so it's firm. Add more moss. So the oncidium can be in either fine bark or sphagnum? I don't sphagnum moss. Generally speaking, you can use either, either mix. Either the moss, and a lot of people will put perlite in with the sphagnum moss. And I just pack it in snugly. Again, leaving a little bit of space at the top of the pot. And you can see it, it, it smashes down quite, quite readily. Just keep stuffing it in. Put the roots down in there. More moss. Okay. Now, one advantage of moss is it stays moist longer than bark. So if you don't water a lot, and don't have time to water a lot, it works for you. And there you go. Now you see, I'm holding the plant and the pot comes up with it. Whether you use bark or you use moss, the, the thing should be in tightly enough so that the, you can pick up the plant and have the pot come with it. It doesn't always work with terracotta, but it works really good with the plastic pots. Okay. Now you've seen how we repot, the basic uh, art of repotting orchids. One of the other things we talk about, oh yeah, when to repot. Okay, I think I feel, said that, when the plant is going out of the pot or every two or three years, because that's when the stuff breaks down. Now, next thing we're gonna talk about are pests. Unfortunately, no matter how well we take care of our plants, we're gonna have pests. Now, the major pests that bother orchids are of course, if they have them outside, snails and slugs, and uh, sluggo is good for that. Uh, most metaldehyde baits aren't that good for them. They will kill the weak snails, but they won't kill the, um, the, straw, the, the, the healthy ones. That, that way you get, you get um, I really call it, uh, instant satisfaction, but by the same time, uh, uh, the, uh, you buy more of it because the snails keep it popular. Sluggo works on a different principle. It's non-toxic. And it works very, very well. Um, or the other thing, some standard pests that happen to a lot of our plants, uh, aphids are one. Uh, scale, ones that look like little, little volcanoes, usually on the underside of the leaves is another. Mealybugs are, are, very, are a favorite. And then sometimes thrips. Um, 
Um, mealybugs are little white cottony insects that usually inhabit the, the crevices and um, the undersides of the plant. And scale, it looks like a little BB or a half a BB, a little, little volcano, a little black, brown thing, usually on the underside as well. We also have um, um, aphids, which I think everybody knows what aphids look like. And they will attack usually the flowers and the growing stems. And thrips tend to attack the flowers. And finally, it looks like, have you ever looked down, you know, you've seen one of these aerial pictures of one, uh, like a, a path through a field or something where it kind of looks like it's been eaten out. They, they do is they kind of cut paths or grooves through your flowers. Uh, those are the main pests that you have to worry about as far as insects. To take care of them, especially in our houses, we don't want to use anything too strong. Things like uh, Safer's insecticidal soap work really well. If you get spider mites, which don't happen too much outside, but will happen sometimes inside, you get sort of a silvery tinge on the backs of the leaves or little black spots. They're hard to see. It's because you're not giving them enough humidity. If you raise the humidity, usually you can discourage the spider mites without having to get too vicious with them. Um, the fungus we've already talked about, you can get something like Safer's three in one or any Safer's insecticidal soap will work very, very well. Uh, you can make your own things. And this is this is plain sulfur. So if you have, you have fungus, just get yourself some garden sulfur or, the, or like the three in one has it built into it. And you can just uh, sprinkle it on the, um, on the plant and it will inhibit the, uh, the uh, fungus or mold. Um, if sometimes you'll, you'll see little black spots on your leaves. Now, for some, some orchids, it seems to be genetic because everyone has, every one of that species has it. But if the spots are just stationary, that's not so bad, but they start to get bigger. Then you have a problem. You've got fungus and you're gonna to have to take care of it. Then um, how often and what to do. If you spray your plant, spray it at least three times, about three days apart. The reason is you'll kill the, the, the bugs fairly well the first time, but you're not gonna kill the eggs. The eggs are gonna hatch and the next generation is gonna start. And you wanna spray them again before they reach bug puberty and start this whole thing over again. So spray them at least three times and keep an eye on it and you should be okay. As far as uh, stopping virus, there is no way to stop virus if your plant gets it. That's why we sanitize everything we use. If you wanna use a pot over, be sure you, you soak it in a 10% bleach solution and wash it very thoroughly. The next thing that I have to talk about is I'm not able to talk about everything that there is to talk about about orchids. Best thing to do is for you to learn. Have you ever watched the Antiques Roadshow where the guy brings in a piece of pre-Columbian art? Turns out it was made last month. And the guy says, you know, read first, learn what you're getting into and then do it. Well, there are a lot of sources. Of course, you can go online and you'll get all kinds of things. And, and people give different information, say this plant grows this way or it grows that way. And you'll get conflicting information. It's not necessarily, you know, false news or anything. What it is, is we have a lot of variables that we don't really know much about. And somebody is growing in one way, has variables he's not mentioning, and you can follow the variables he has mentioned, still not get results. So study different things. A good source too are culture sheets. You can get them at orchid shows. Um, the American Orchid Society, the Canadian Orchid Society, the Royal or uh, Horticultural Society in England, they have culture sheets, read them. And then of course you can get, um, where you buy your orchid, you know, the place, the people want you to be happy with your orchids. So they usually have people who know about orchids and they'll be glad to help you. Join a society. There are orchid societies all around. You're bound to find one. Join, people will help you. You can get plants there. They'll give you advice. They have very nice talks that help you to learn to grow orchids. And, um, oh, and when you do buy plants, I often advise people to buy local. And why is that? Because we do have a different climate here. And a lot of times plants are used to one climate. It takes a while for them to adjust to another one. Also people tend to buy plants from um, tropical countries that are on the other side of the equator. Well, their seasons are reversed from ours. And it's very hard for, to reset an orchid's clock so that it will live comfortably in, in your home. So, let somebody else do that. Buy locally, it's already, <laughs> it's already adjusted to your climate and it'll work much better for you. Also, if you want, you're more than welcome to contact me. My uh, email is paulborbin, that's P-A-U-L, 
B-O-U-R-B-I-N at hotmail.com. Paul Borbin at hotmail.com. And I'll try to answer your questions for you. And um, also there's three ways to grow orchids. I always forget to mention this. One way is to try one of everything and see what lives. That's the Darwin method. Um, secondly, you can find the orchid that you really truly love that you want to live with the rest of your life. Find out what conditions that particular plant or, or genus requires and then create the environment for it. That's like we do at the conservatory. Or you can read about the different orchids and see which ones will grow in the environment you're willing to provide with your, with your growing conditions. And that will give you the best success and you'll start out happily. And then you can you know, expand your horizons from there as you gain more knowledge and experience. And I think that's about it. We're running over time here. Are there any questions that I can answer? That was awesome. So much good information. Yeah. That was that was amazing, Paul. Thank you. I have a feeling you're going to be really sad that you posted your email address. I know, I still yeah, I mean, I don't think you can undo it at this point in time, but I have a feeling that a uh, sloat is going to bombard you from here on out. Um, a couple of questions. People call me at midnight to get me upset. I I think we'll we'll stop short of that, but your email is going to be full from here on out. Um, a couple of questions that seem to be carries over. Um, um, you said you said during your presentation using the plastic pots with the slits, um, but then when you repotted the ones that you have there, they obviously are not. Is there is there a real reason to stick with those? Oh, this pot has sl slits. Does it? Okay. This one does. This one doesn't. Okay. Um, I I don't. I use them interchangeably. Um, okay. They okay. do give you more air circulation, especially with this plant because its roots are are kind of uh, iffy there. I want to have as much air circulation as possible because I don't want any rot to continue. Understood. So I use I've used both commercially. We almost always use just the same pot. But right. It, these other pots are, are nicer because it's not a requirement, it's just to help. Okay. Um, and then there was a couple of questions about, you know, you get those, the grayish kind of light green, like feeder roots that come out of every orchid that we've ever seen. Is that an indication of them needing to be repotted? Are those technically dead when they kind of get that grayish white look to them? I saw when you were repotting that you tucked a few of them in, but they tend to be the thing that you see the most coming out of the top. So what are those and how should we treat them? Same way you treat any root, get it down into the mix when you repot it. Okay. Some, some plants, especially things like, um, I'm seeing a lot of them, they, they grow roots everywhere. Right. And these, these roots are used to being in the air, it doesn't bother them, but they just, they're just growing and they're always reaching out so they can find a, a better mm -hmm. place to walk on, more security, better food. See, you know, they, they spread out because orchids in the end, there's nobody fertilizing these things in nature. Right. Whenever they get food from bird droppings and the composted leaf material, things like that, they'll wash over them. And so uh, you don't, you know, you don't need to and just leave the plant is in in the pot, you know, in its pot, and pull all the roots down into the pot because they, you don't need them. The plant doesn't need to be feeling around for a better location. Understood. Okay. And then um, you you use the flame to um, to sterilize the clippers. Since yeah. not all of us have a, a you know a burner on the side, there is alcohol okay? Is it is it a no no? What's another way to sterilize if you don't have um, a flame? Well, you can sterilize with alcohol, but you have to soak the thing in the alcohol for like 10 minutes before you can use it or bleach, so a strong bleach solution. But the reason that, the main thing you want to kill, uh, in a, in, I guess you want to kill all the other parasites or things, are, are the viruses. The viruses are very tough. Yeah. And so you have to, flame is the best. You can okay. soak your thing in alcohol or bleach and it'll work pretty well. Generally, as the bleach starts to attack, the, you know, the bleach yeah. is starting to attack your, your, your tools at the same time. I think it's kind of like that corrosive. Sure. It's as an alternative, but a, a very secondary. 
Yeah. So but I mean, from that, they use both. They use alcohol and anything. Wow. Um, but I'm sure on our end, as a as a lesser, we could use like a lighter or you know one of those nice fireplace with the elongated, you know, something yeah. like that is fine. That's what I mentioned. Those. Yeah. yeah, you can use those uh, flame, those ones you get for lighting the fireplace. You okay. Know, like, Zippo lighters will work. Yeah. Yes, sure. yeah. Probably you could get by with a candle, right? <laughs> Okay, that's good to know. Uh, okay, so the last thing, and I think it's the thing that everybody always asks, is how long does it take to rebloom? I mean, what exactly, and, and I'm sure that that's a terrible question and probably the one that you get the most, but I mean, how long should we be waiting once we did everything? Let's say we did everything right, first of all. Let's say we repotted it correctly, we trimmed it down the way it was supposed to be, it's planted in what it's supposed to be planted in, we're watering it to the side regularly, et cetera, et cetera. When can we you know, expect a, a new bloom, a new stalk? Generally speaking, orchids bloom once a year. Okay. We usually bloom the same time every year, more or less, but they always bloom once a year. It takes them that long to store up the food they need to flower. Now, okay. some orchids do bloom more often. Um, a few catlings do, but Antonius bloom twice a year, and if you're really good, you can bloom, bloom three times a year. But most of the, and some of them are sort of a continuous bloom cycle, but for the most part, it's once a year. Okay. If the plant is, you know, been Tortured to death, like both of these have been, it may take an extra year to get them going. But once you get them going right, then they should go regularly for you. Okay, perfect. Um, there were a couple of questions, and I'm going to ask people specifically to reach out to you since you did post your email after all. There were a couple of questions about the um, the orchid, the cactus orchid. Is there oh, anything? Yes. Is there anything different about what you've spoken about today that you know you would relate to them? Oh, sure. The uh, orchid cactus are epiphyllums. They're technically cactus, they're not orchids, but okay. they evolve because, you know, the, the continents move and everything. They evolve to live in trees because they went from, I guess, dry, a drier environment to a wetter one. Um, yes, you can grow them in, a, in an orchid mix, but generally I, I put in more, um, more solid stuff, like um, you can use sand or, or a good potting mix. Mix it with your orchid bark. Okay, and um, they will they will flower once a year for you too. The season's over now. Uh, they tend to want to to drape down. They they have sort of a pendulous habit when they get going, you know. And so you know, put them in a in a pot where they can they go they can grow over it and then dangle down. They uh, don't have to be repotted nearly as often as uh, orchids do. They seem to be very um, tolerant of what they live in. I, I have epiphyllums that I made from cuttings from my grandmother's plants in 1957. I still have the plants. The leaves, of course, have moved on. Leaves don't live that long, but the plants have continued to exist that long. And some of them are, uh, are growing in the ground, and some of them are growing in pots, and they seem to do very well with it. Just make sure they have good drainage, right. and, they'll, and uh, they'll let them completely dry out. The time to prune them because you prune them probably more than you pot them is after they stop flowering and the uh, the flowers have dropped off. That's a good time to prune them because sometimes you get kind of gangly or or sluggy halfway through a leaf or something. And you want to remove it. And they're very easy to grow from cuttings, by the way. You just cut one of the the, the leaves off and you can just stuff it into uh, a pot with some honey mix and keep it moist. Takes a long time, so we want to use rooting hormone, but eventually it will grow for them. Wow. Okay. They're Great. wonderful plants. Awesome. Hey Jen, I actually have a question for you. Um, somebody asked about the Q and A. Yeah. Whether you know, she was saying that she was looking at the um, all the presentations online that we have, but that she can't access the Q and A from there. Is there a way to, or is this it? Not that I know of. Um, okay. I can. I can print out, I, I can generate a list of all the questions and the answers. Um, yeah, I mean, so if there's a specific class that you're curious about the Q&A, I can pull that up through Zoom. But okay. other than that, no, I don't know. It, it'd be nice if it just like automatically appeared For on sure. the video or something and it doesn't. Right. Okay. 
Okay, well, we'll have to work on that then. Uh, webinar world, it's mm -hmm. the limitations of Zoom. Who knew that there were any limitations of Zoom? <laughs> yeah, Paul, thank you so much. This was okay. truly one of the more informative. I've had you know comment after comment um, online here, just of people being really wowed by all the information and really appreciative of all the expertise you bring to the table. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, this was great. Paul mentioned ahead of time that um, he normally does, you know, one on, not one on one, but like live classes where he can kind of bounce off of questions and that, you know, he was a little ambivalent about the script, but uh, you did awesome and we really appreciate it so much. Well, I will be Thank at the you. Orchid Show, I will be at the Orchid Show with the San Francisco Orchid Society Show, which will be the last, the last weekend in February. So hmm. people want to come there. I will be there soon in New York and Dr. Blues. And we're going to try to have him back and his wife for, for a follow-up for this. Apparently, they're the orchid doctor and nurse. Of That's the awesome. Depot. I'm super excited about that. Yeah, who knew? I'm so <laughs> excited. <laughs> Okay, so just a quick reminder for everybody that we've got um, a bundle of other, other webinars coming up this month. As I mentioned earlier, Beyond Lawns is on the 9th of October with Bonnie Morse. Soil Health Basics with Charlotte and Suzanne from Oh Wow, and that's on the 16th. And then Creating a Succulent Pumpkin with Jen on the 20th, just in time for, um, for Halloween. So very exciting. Thank you guys all for joining us today. Appreciate all of your kind comments and uh, all your good questions. Look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. Yeah. Bye.